Ah, an American audience. You can tell I'm not the one with the strange accent. You are. And of course, you can tell I am not from this village. I'm not from your neck of the woods. Neither are you from my neck of the woods. But in my neck of the woods, we do things quite differently. Everybody brought their Bibles with them here today? Anybody forgot their Bibles here with them today? Raise your hand, please. Okay. Mrs. Marderosian, I would never think you would forget your Bible. Now I have to have the ushers take you to the back and shoot you. <laughs> and that's how we solve this problem in my neck of the woods. No, Pastor, it is meant to be allegoric. Pastors always get nervous when I begin to speak because they don't know what I'm going to say. I remember when I first came to America, my grandfather told me, son, you have to assimilate now. Assimilate. I have to basically mold into the American fabric. I can admit I am still working on my assimilation. haven't completely assimilated because there are some things I just can never understand. I could not understand American shopping. What's with the shopping stuff? You guys shop more than anybody on earth. You go to the malls. You build your house like a U. You know, like a U. There's a garage here. There's the kitchen. There's the living room. There's the entrance of the house. You know, the stuff comes in from the entrance and it keeps going and goes to the garage. And then at the end of the year, miraculously, the door opens up like open sesame. And there's a sign called garage sale. They call the people who drive SUVs conservatives and the people who drive those little cucaracha cars to be kind of liberal and it's the other way around. You know, I don't get it. What are you conserving when you spend all this gasoline? And that, where does the money go when you buy all this gasoline anyway? You burn it. It goes to the Middle East, to the Arabs who basically take all these billions and trillions of dollars and buy properties here and build mosques all over Timbuktu and all of a sudden you have to kowtow and say Islam is a peaceful religion. Islam is a peace-loving religion. You have to be molded these days. Everybody must say Islam is a peace-loving religion. Now, ah, I said something that is somehow controversial and I learned also that word during my attempt to assimilate. Walid Shubar is a controversial figure. What does that mean, controversial figure? You know, he is not very diplomatic. You know, I, I learned, you know, there's one thing everybody keeps talking about, even in churches, you know, that doesn't exist anywhere in the Bible, and that's the word diplomacy. In my dictionary, if you want to learn what diplomacy means, from a biblical perspective, please see hypocrisy. It's all hypocrisy. I just could never assimilate fully. I'm sorry. I, I tried. I could never like football. I know I will get crucified. If Jesus Christ came to America, they probably crucify him because he criticized football. I don't think Jesus would like football. I mean, who would like to see a bunch of guys dressed up in leotards fighting over <laughs> some piece of rubber, oblong shaped rubber? They all bend over and they're all beating the heck out of each other and. And they don't even kick the ball. It's just they kick it once and everything else has beat the heck out of each other. And I looked at that stuff and I said, ah, it's not for me. Uh, I could never blend in, never blend in. And I, I went to churches when I was Muslim in this country. I remember walking into Chuck Smith's church and I, I could never un understand lots of things. I, I remember the first time I asked for a Christian girl to witness to me I was working at Jack in a Box and Graveyard Shift. And I said, Merlin, you, you told me that there is evidence and the truth for what you believe in Christianity. Tell me, why do you believe in Christianity? I mean, what a question. And uh, she says, well, I, I, I believe uh, in Christianity because I have the miraculous ability to speak in tongues. That was a graveyard shift. I said, can you show me a demonstration? What are you talking about? And she raised her hand and she said, shura barahanda, shura barahanda, shura barahanda, shura barahanda. And I said, why don't you just go buy a Toyota instead? <laughs> I remember leaving Jack in the Box. I said, I will never, ever talk to Christians again. I had enough of it. And every time I met a Christian, they wanted to witness to me. He says, give me the evidence for your Bible. Give me the evidence of why you believe what you believe. 
I was doing God's will. I was asking you to give an answer to the testimony that you believe in. But I never once got an answer for anyone's testimony. I roamed around this country looking for the truth and nobody would tell me. I lived in Bethlehem, a little village, all my life. And tourists would come and we would go greet them and talk to them. And none of them will tell us about their truth. Or oh, beware of Palestinians, you know, they're terrorists and all these things. And you came to our land and we never knew why you were visiting this land. We never even appreciated what was going on in that land, even though we ourselves lived in that land. You did appreciate the stones and the dust of that land. So I'm not here to criticize you. There's much that you have given to the world that is so tremendous. I'm not looking about the bad things about America, like football. I'm looking about the good things in America, like Christianity. And I remember, I, I don't want to share my testimony how I was a terrorist, planted a bomb, and did all these violent things. I'm not here to gross you out about all this stuff, but I'm here to basically tell you what I've discovered here in America. I remember the time when I told my wife Maria, I says, Maria, you know, it is time for you to convert to Islam. She was basically grew up a Catholic, and Maria says to me, well, why? should I leave my biblical heritage? Wow, now there is a person who challenged me as I was challenging those Christians I was running into in America. And uh, I says, well, the Bible has been corrupted. That's why you should become a Muslim. All Muslims all over the world believe the Bible has been changed and the Quran is the truth and the Quran came to correct the Bible. Quran was the truth, Maria. She says, well, show me these corruptions in the Bible and I will be glad to convert to Islam. Praise Allah. I'm going to go find those problems in the Bible and my wife is going to become a good Muslim wife. She'll wear a hijab and I will live happily ever after. I will have Muslim children and this is great. I'm going to find the corruptions in the Bible and prove my wife wrong. The first thing I learned as I went through my endeavor and my search was I discovered the, the book of Shubat. Have you heard of the book of Shubat? Yes, it is a book of Shubat, my book. In chapter 1, verse 1 in Shubat, Pastor, don't get nervous. It says, man thought he was smart, but woman is smarter. She simply asked me a question. Show me the evidence of the corruptions in the Bible and I will be glad to convert to Islam. My wife witnessed to me in a way that I never understood and I went looking for a Bible. I purchased a Bible for 10 bucks, $10. King James, blue covers, and I wore the thing out looking for the corruptions in the Bible. I was so shocked to read what I read. For the first time in my life, really, I began to look into the scripture without any interference from pastors or anyone or churches or Christians or Shura Barahanda or Teora or all these, you know, what I call freaks. I began to look into the text right there in Genesis. God says, I will put enmity between you, Lucifer, and the woman. There's this woman again. That the devil hates the woman because the woman was the vessel she brought forth the seed of the Messiah sorry guys God chose them and the enmity between Lucifer and the woman I began to learn right there that all cults every single one of them hates women all cults abuses women it was Christianity that brought freedom to women and these days they say Christianity is a backward system it's not it is what made the West great. It was what made this country great. And by the time I read the Bible, and by the time you reach Isaiah, the prophet, for I am God and there is no other. I am God, there is none like me. There is no God like the God of the Bible. Foretelling the end from the beginning. So when you see it happen, that you know that I am God. He's the God of the prophetic word. He's the God that proclaims the future in the past. It is futurology 101. 
the class I needed all my life that I went to universities and took psychology 101, English 101, everything 101. It was all garbage. But now I'm into prophecy 101. I was so fascinated with what I was reading. I was reading words that came out of my homeland. But the land, the typography, the eastern mentality, the culture, everything. And by the time I, I, I read the book, I began to see American culture really is contrary to what the Bible says. Even the churches are contrary to what the Bible says. Here you have, you know, when I first went to church, I remember, you know, you got the, you got the uh, youth ministry. Then you got the uh, newly, newly uh, singles ministry, uh, newly couple, newly married couple ministry. And then... You have the middle age group, you know, kind of salt and pepper right there, having been salt already, ministry. Then I looked over there and said, what's that over there? It says, that, you don't, we don't want to go there. That's where the old geezers hang out and play bingo. I says, well, wait a minute. The Bible says, let your older women teach your younger women. If you have the younger women down there and the older women down there and the newlyweds right here, what do you think a new newlywed do all the time when they first get married? Number one, fight. They fight. They go to the class in Sunday school. He, he was so abusive. He called me names. What did he tell you? He called you, what? Walk out. Make sure you take the credit card with you. Walk out. An older woman would say what? Darling, let me tell you something about marriage. Ignore. <laughs> Lesson number two. Ignore. Lesson number three. Go to lesson number one. Ignore, ignore, ignore. At the end of the night, he needs you. He wants something, and then he will be on his knees, and you can get the credit card then anyway. <laughs> men need women. Women don't need men. Period. They don't need us. I can stand on the street corner. I can lift up and show those hairy legs all day long. Nobody stops. Have your wife try it. <laughs> Get in a truck, you know. <laughs> it is just the way it is. My marriage was hell the first year. Muslim, a Catholic, it just never worked out. It was time to mix oil with water. And here I was discovering things. I spent an entire year, wherever I went, even if I went to the John, I took biblical verses to study. I was so hungry with God's word. Why? Because I had made a prayer and a commitment to God. I said, God, show me the corruptions in the Bible. And I'm talking to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I know you're out there. I know you know the truth. I know you have your will for my life. If you show me the truth, I will do whatever you want. I will go the roam the whole world if you want me to. Just show me the problems in the Bible. Show me the truth, and I will follow you wherever you please. I should have never said the last sentence. I will go wherever you want. Here I am. Most speakers come out and say, I'm glad to be here today. No, I'm not glad to be. I'd rather be with Maria at home. I began to read further into the Bible, spending a year not telling Maria that she was right and I was wrong. It's very difficult for a male Middle Easterner to confess that he was wrong. But I was shocked by the time I reached all these prophecies about Jesus coming to earth, about Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. I began to learn how it is like to be acquainted with grief when I became a Christian. I began to see the moment I became a Christian how the slander became to hail at you like arrows from all over. You'd have major media attack you and lie about you and say all sorts of things about you. I began to learn fairly quickly what the Bible taught me is be ready to carry a cross, be ready to suffer. I remember the time when CNN attacked me. It was global, all over the world, international. Imagine, turn on your TV set. Imagine, Pastor. Where's your wife, Pastor? That's your wife right there. Imagine turn the TV on and somebody says, you know, uh, they've been shacking up together. Uh, we never found their marriage certificate. They must have been shacking up. What if they were married in Mexico? Imagine making all kinds of lies about your pastor and you turn your TV on and 
You go to Sunday and you look at your pastor very funny. You believe what you heard on TV when it was all a lie. I remember standing in the kitchen in front of Maria and says, Why me? Why all these attacks? My wife Maria always, God bless her. She really helped me out a lot. She said, Honey, who do you think you are? I said, Now I want insults from you too. She said, You don't understand what I am saying. She said, Who do you think you are? If they slander Jesus Christ himself, don't you think they will slander you? Did you forget what Jesus himself said? Blessed are you when they persecute you. Blessed are you when they say all kinds of calumny against you for my namesake. Most Americans don't even know what the word calumny means. I will teach you English too, yes. Calumny, slander. The first thing they will do to you when you become a believer is they will slander you. You will be slandered. If I search your pastor's name on the internet, there better be a bunch of garbage on him. Because if he's all oh, nice, 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 I'm really concerned. They will hate you for what you believe. They will reject you. They will kill you. He said, I send you a sheep amongst wolves. All these things I read. Fascinating things. By the time you reach the book of Joel, and there you see how Christ comes down to earth. I will gather all nations to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Then there is Messiah. He will enter into judgment. He judges the nations. For they have scattered my people. They have also divided up my land. That the land of Israel will be divided. And I was all my life an anti-Israel terrorist. All my life I wanted to destroy Israel. I remember even my mother who was a Christian. She's an American. Just like you. She could never assimilate in the Middle Eastern culture. She didn't realize when she married my father that he could take her to the Middle East and she can say goodbye to her country and she has no right to even return. Girls, don't marry a Muslim. Am I racist? No. Do not be unequally yoked. The pastor is right. Your parents are right. No, love doesn't conquer all in that case. Love is not to marry out of your belief. You must marry somebody who believes the same way you believe. My mother didn't realize one instruction out of the Bible. Married my father, a Muslim. He went to the Middle East and she lost everything. The only way for her to return is that it took 30 some years for her son in America finally, who came to America, who became a Christian, who rescued her in 1994, one year after I became a believer. He says, out of all the people in the world, I would never think you, the most zealous Muslim in the family, would rescue my life. There is not a single Muslim country in the world that is signatory to the Hague Convention regarding the abduction of women. They hate women. When you get to the part in the Bible and in Daniel where it talks about the Antichrist, Let's discuss the Antichrist, shall we? Oh, Ali, we should discuss Jesus. Yes, but Jesus also talks about the Antichrist. Well, Ali, I'm not interested in the Antichrist. I'm interested in, I'm interested in Jesus and Him crucified. Well, you're right. But if that's all I'm supposed to talk about, if I'm supposed to only talk about the Gospel, why didn't God give us the four spiritual laws in a booklet? Why he gave us all this? Why give us all these books? Why all this detail? Because everything counts. It all counts. By the time I remember even asking Christians, I became Christian, they talk about the Antichrist. Sunday school was prophecy. I, I liked the prophecy part in Sunday school. And, you know, I, I sat down in Sunday school in this American culture, and they told me, you know, the Antichrist is some homosexual figure who comes out of the European Union he will lead the European Union and he's a homosexual most likely he'd be a French or German homosexual because the European Union includes France Germany Spain Italy all these countries he's a French homosexual if you don't believe me John Hagee I look I like John Hagee he's a friend of mine but he said he got on Glenn Beck and he says the Antichrist is most likely a French German homosexual well, how do you know, number one, he's French or German? Number two, how do you know he's homosexual? Show me where in the Bible it says 
the Antichrist is even homosexual. Can somebody show me? Why do you believe all these things? Tradition. Let's go to the Bible, shall we? You all have your Bibles, right? We only shot one person in this crowd, and that's my friend, Mrs. Merdirosian. Daniel chapter 11. And in Daniel chapter 11, it tells us the summary of the Antichrist. But before I delve into Daniel 11, I must ask you to all remember one very crucial verse in the Bible about Antichrist. And that is 1 John chapter 2, verse 21, 22, all that area. And 1 John. What does it say in 1 John? Who is the liar? Who is what? Who is the liar? God speaks. Who is the liar? Boy, God doesn't mince words. Who is the liar? It is but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ, that God became flesh. He is Antichrist that denies the Father and the what? Son. The Antichrist spirit denies the Father and the Son. It is the Aryan heresy that has been dealt with from the beginning of Christianity all the way till now. The Antichrist is not some Catholic guy. Catholics don't deny Father and Son. The Antichrist, his spirit, the spirit of the Antichrist must deny the Father and must deny the Son. Why is that crucial? Because there is one religion that is vehemently anti-father and anti-son and that is the religion of Islam if you ask me what is Islam I can summarize Islam in one sentence the denial of the father and the denial of the son if you don't believe me next time you go to a 7-eleven ask the guy behind the cash register <laughs> ask him what do you what do you have problems with Christianity he will tell you you say that God is our father you say that Jesus is the son of God God has no son. We memorize the verses in the Quran. God has not begotten a son. This is the most blasphemous thing. Because most Americans think when they think of Islam, they think it's just another religion. No, Islam is a Christian heresy. By the time I read the Bible, I indeed discovered in the end that the Bible indeed was corrupted. Pastor, don't get nervous. Congregation, I'm entitled to my last words before you burn me at the stake. I know my rights. The Bible indeed has been corrupted, Pastor. The Quran was the corruption of the Bible. Cults corrupt the Bible all the time. They write books against the Bible all the time. They say, here's another book that will lead you to the truth. Besides the Bible. The Bible is the truth. The Bible was never corrupted. The Quran is that corruption. <coughs> In other words, the enemy will always accuse you of the very thing the enemy is guilty of. The Bible was never corrupted. The Quran came to denounce the Father and the Son. The Trinity is an anathema in Islam. The Antichrist will behead Christians because they believe in the Trinity. Oh, the Trinity doesn't matter. It does. If you deny the Holy Spirit, you're not a believer. In Islam, the Holy Spirit was the angel that came to Muhammad who was Lucifer. Muhammad saw an angel of light. A oh boy, if I can go days explaining to you what Muhammad saw in his visions, what he did in Al-Isra wal miraj when he ascended to heaven. All these things that you find in Isaiah 14, even the Antichrist. You have said your heart, in your heart, I have ascended to heaven. The ascension of Al-Isra wal miraj all these things. The Mahdiism in Islam today, the Muslim world, how they're collectively getting together, conspiring to annihilate Christianity. The persecution that is on the doorways, that is going to happen very soon in which Christians will be beheaded for refusing to bow to the image of the beast. Wow. Before I delve into all these things, maybe I don't have time, but let's take a look 
at the Antichrist himself. In verse 37, he shall regard neither the God of his fathers nor the desire of women. Walid, he's homosexual. He doesn't desire women. Is that what it says? Does it say he doesn't desire women? Or does it say he will not honor the desire of women? Women's desires he doesn't care about because the son of perdition, the Antichrist, is like his father, Lucifer, the father of lies, who in the garden had animosity against the woman because the woman brought forth the Messiah. He hates the woman. They mistreat women. Wow. Nowhere it says he's French. Nowhere it says he's German. In fact, did you know, and I challenge anyone here, I've asked these questions all over the globe. No one can answer them. I learned from Jesus how to ask questions. You know, when Jesus asks a question, it's usually a checkmate kind of question. There's only one way to answer. Confess you're an idiot or look like a fool. Take a pick. John the Baptist, the Pharisees. Remember the story? Who do you say John the Baptist is? If they say he's not a prophet, oh, they get stoned. If they say he is a prophet, well, he said, I'm, I'm the Messiah. Nah, 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 nah. Right? Jesus style question. And I ask Jesus style questions all the time. I'll show you a Jesus style question. If you look at the entire Bible and you study every single nation that God deals with, in the ends of days, God's going to deal with specific nations that he names them by name. Did you know that? You know, all the stuff you read in Revelation, the beast, the Antichrist, all these things. Do you know all that's interpreted for you already? It's interpreted for you in the Old Testament, but you never read it. You never really read it. You read Ezekiel 38, but you never read Ezekiel 28. I bet you if I make a test right now about Ezekiel 28, you'll all flunk. 38, maybe 50% of you will get an A. The rest will get an F. But, you know, there's so much in the Bible about these nations that God deals with. In every single nation that God deals with in the ends of times, all the nations that are mentioned by name are Muslim. Did you ever think about that? It's even much more important than that. In every single verse in the Bible where Christ fights a nation, and that nation he fights is mentioned by name. That nation is Muslim today. Do you ever think about that? Where is Jesus coming out of Germany or France or even Italy or even Rome? Well, sure, the Bible has Rome mentioned several times. Not once does he mention it literally by name. Where is the burden against Rome? But the burden against Arabia is all over the Bible. Why don't you study the burden against Arabia? And who destroys Arabia? And how significant is Arabia in the Bible? I could give an hour lecture about Arabia and the Bible. But in America, they say, wrap it up. You only have 45 minutes. Right, Pastor? Or else they don't collect a love offering for you and you go home empty pocket. Every verse that Christ comes to fight, and that nation that he fights is mentioned by name. Every single one is Muslim. In fact, you even sing the song all the time. I, I know the messianics do it all the time. Behold, he comes riding on the clouds at the trumpet call, right? Lift your voice. I don't have a melodious voice like you do. When I sing, the flies don't fly. It's a year of jubilee. Out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. Behold, he comes riding on the clouds. And I always ask the question, if he's coming riding on the clouds, where is he going? You know, nobody knew. You broke the Guinness Book of Records of singing songs that you don't even know what they mean. Where is he going? They don't know. Well, the verse comes from Isaiah chapter 19. Behold, the Lord comes riding on a swift cloud and is coming into Egypt. Hello? Egypt? Well, we don't really like all those names, Egypt, Syria. We just want to make a song to praise the Lord. Let's take those names out. So you make all these songs and the countries are taken out. So you don't know what in the world is going on. Every time you discuss prophecy, you go to the book of Revelation all the time. 
Well, why don't you start in Genesis? The Bible starts from Genesis, not Revelation. The allegoric parts have already been interpreted for you in the beginning. So when you begin to read the Bible, by the time you get to Revelation, you'll begin to understand what Revelation is talking about. You know, Jesus, in Isaiah 63, he comes out of where? Somebody tell me, come on, it's a quiz. Yes, there'll be F. Some of you will be shot at the spot. Isaiah 63, when he comes with his garment sprinkled with blood, where is he coming from? Nobody knows. Shoot them all. There is no excuse. You're waiting for Jesus? I am waiting for Jesus. And what does Jesus want me to do while I wait for him? While he tarries, what must I do as his servant? Work hard. Save Christians. Save the suffering and the persecuted. Because even in Isaiah 19, the believers in Egypt will cry to the Lord to send them a savior. And he will send them a savior and a mighty one. Who is the mighty one? Jesus. The psalm says, gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one. He comes to rescue the believers in Egypt. Who are the believers in Egypt? Copts. How many of you have ever looked up the word copt? Oh, these are not evangelical kind, you know, uh, oh, Greek Orthodox, we, we don't like these guys. Well, he never mentioned the evangelicals in America. He comes out of Edom, Isaiah 63. He comes out of Edom with his garments sprinkled with blood. He fights in Edom. Where is Edom? Some might say Jordan. But the Bible gives us a greater definition. In Ezekiel 25, in Ezekiel 25, God says, I will stretch out my arm against Edom. God stretches out his arm. What is God's arm? Nobody knows. God's arm means something. Look at Isaiah 53. What is the first verse in Isaiah 53? Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? To whom has the Messiah been revealed? The arm of the Lord is the Messiah himself. God will send the Messiah. I will stretch out my arm against Edom and make it desolate from Timan and they of Dedan shall fall by the sword. American Christian says Timan, Dedan, uh, skip. I, I don't know. What about me, Lord? It's so personal. Everything is so personal. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He loves the world, the earth. We need to save the earth. He talks about Edom. He will send him to Edom. He will fight in Edom. Where is Timan? Yemen. Dedan, Arabia. He treads the wine press in Isaiah 63. You know, you read Revelation when he treads the wine press. You go, well, we know maybe that's Rome. He treads the wine press. He tells you in Isaiah 63 where that wine press is. It's in Arabia. He even tells you Iran will destroy Arabia. Why? Because as you thought all these years that the Hall of Babylon is uh, Roman Catholics, Sean Hannity is not the Antichrist. Bill O'Reilly is not an Antichrist. These guys don't deny the Father and the Son. And I got you all nervous by now. You want to throw me out. But let's look, take a look at the text. The Antichrist denies the Father and the Son. I can stand up on the street corner right here, day in and day out, and say the Catholic Church is the harlot of Babylon, and say the European Union is the Antichrist, and no one kills you. But I dare you to stand on the street corner and say Islam is the religion of the Antichrist. And Arabia is that harlot. It's an abomination. Mecca is an abomination to God. People bowing all day long, cutting heads off so they can bow towards that image in Mecca. It's an abomination to God. Tell me, would you have the courage to do it? Most of you will be afraid. Most of you will convert to Islam and repent later. You're afraid of Islam. You're afraid of the enemy. You talk about John the Baptist. John the Baptist lost his head. 
He was symbol of the church that exposed the Antichrist. And as a result of exposing the Antichrist, he lost his head. I will lose mine too. But before I lose mine, maybe I care about you enough to tell you you've been infiltrated. Your country's been infiltrated. You have a president who's a Muslim. Oh, he's not a Muslim. I think every time somebody criticizes you so much, when you say something, it's most likely it's because it's the truth. How do you know the truth? Say it, and everybody throws arrows at you. It's the truth. When people compliment you, it's the lie. Forget diplomacy. You're so smart, you've been infiltrated. I'm the only one in this country, in fact, who got on Fox News all over exposing the infiltration. I am the one who exposed Obama's grandmother and uncle and cousin running a whole scamming operation, collecting funds from the Saudi Wahhabists into Kenya. This stuff is horrible what is happening to your country. You have been sleeping and slumbering. You didn't care about your country. You want to rapture and get the hell out and down with the country? I love your country more than you. Heck, I love you more than you love yourself. Because to love your brother is to risk your life for your brother. To love your brother is to lay your life for your brother. Not to care. I care about this country. God cares about nationalism. Right there in the Tower of Babel, God cared about nationalism. He divided the tongues. He did not want one world order. He did not want a United Nations. He wanted a United States. It is righteous to be a patriot. It is biblical to be a patriot. God planted in us to be very nationalistic. God planted in us to love the Second Amendment, the First Amendment. They're not going to take my AR-15 on my cold, dead hands. I came to America because I love guns. I used to love guns for the wrong purpose. Now I love them for the right purpose. They want to take away my gun. What's the time? I will get in trouble. If you think America is going to go down, I am concerned about America. Will we go through hard times? Absolutely, yes. Will we have a depression? Yes, very likely. Is it wrong to be a prepper? Look, I'm a prepper too. God wants us to be always preppers. Look at the ten virgins. One was a prepper. Five were preppers. Five weren't preppers. I know there's another meaning to the verses, Pastor. But we can also apply them to that once in a blue moon. There in Daniel, what does it say? If the Antichrist, as you think, is becomes the most powerful leader in the world, and if you really believe that he rules the entire globe, including America, Tell me, what would you do with verse 39? Verse 38, 39, the whole thing. Look at this. He will honor a God of fortresses. Verse 38, number one. The Antichrist honor a God of what? Fortresses, a God of war. Who honors a God of war? Hello? Who is Allah? What is jihad? What do they want? You must convert. You must bow to Mecca in Saudi Arabia. Well, that can't be the beast and the harlot. Yes, it can. Acts chapter 19, verse 35. Let us get technical. Acts chapter 19, verse 35. What does it say? Do not worship Artemis and her image that fell from Zeus, from heaven. Right? What was the image of Artemis that fell from heaven? It was a black stone. It was a meteor. And the New Testament says, don't do that. And it called this meteor an image. Hello? It called it what? An image. So when the Bible says to bow to the image of the beast, hey, a black stone and a meteor does count. Islam, for, from the inception of Islam till today, they beheaded Christians, saying you bow to Mecca, you pray five times a day, or you get your head chopped off. It's only two choices. You either bow or lose your head. I'm not going to bow, and I'm not going to lose my head. I'm going to fight. 
Yes, there is fighting for your life. Husbands, die for your wife. If somebody breaks into my house, my AR-15 is right next to me. Shotgun, too. If I choose to choose the shotgun, it's pretty messy. Now, I demand that my wife cleans up the mess. I did the job, she cleans the mess. We have a need to fight. Stand up and fight and be counted. We need to be like Gideon. Gideon fought. Gideon will fight. Gideon is symbolic of Christ. When Christ comes, he fights. And the believers will, will be with him. The believers will be fighting too. He lands in the Mount of Olives to come to fight. And all the saints will be with you. Wow. I'd like to be one of those saints fighting with Jesus. If you don't like to fight, then don't read the Bible. And right there. Look what it says in verse 39. Thus he, the Antichrist, shall act against the what? Strongest fortresses with a foreign god. Hello? He declares war on the most powerful military countries in the world in the name of a foreign god number one he's not atheist what is this foreign god he comes to fight to make everybody follow his god he believes in a god and he proclaims himself to be god at the same time complex i know there's no contradiction in the bible he sits in the temple of god declaring to himself to be god because the islam believes when the when their messiah comes which is the antichrist he will bring seven years of peace and he will have titles that belongs to God. What does the name Muhammad mean? Muhammad means the praised one. Can you call any man the praised one? Can you imagine? Behold, the praised pastor. His name, the names Muhammad takes, the, the Mahdi takes, so all these Islamic things that I learned. Muhammad says about the Mahdi, he brings seven years of peace. He will rule from Jerusalem. All the things you, you know about prophecy, we also knew. When I read the Bible, what I discovered was that this Antichrist of the Bible describes perfectly what we as Muslims believed in the coming Mahdi, the Islamic Messiah. Perfectly. Everything lines up. I began to look at the Bible and say, why is the Christian Antichrist our Messiah? And their Messiah is our Antichrist. Everything is switched upside down in reverse. Like Isaiah said, they will call evil good and good evil. No, Islam is not conservative. Muslims are not conservative. Conservatives are like the pastor. He, he won't hold hands with homosexuals and lesbians and pro-Palestine and gays and parade. And, do you, pastor? He's a bigot. I'm a bigot. Yet you see the Muslims, they will hold hands with all these groups, pro-Palestine groups, gay groups, Obama loves the gays and homosexuality and abortion and all these things. They don't mind you aborting your fetuses. They want you to lose your children. A country can never be preserved if you kill your children. How dare we kill our children? They multiply theirs. What happened to America? It really turned foolish. It needs to wake up and smell the hummus. Thus, he shall act against the strongest fortresses. If he declares war and against the strongest fortresses, he's not the biggest dog on the block, is he? He declares war on the strongest military machine in the world. There are nations more powerful than his. In fact, those nations that are more powerful than his in the end, will wake up and will destroy the Antichrist. Hello? Turn your Bibles to Ezekiel 28. And I'll, what time is it? No, no, I'm not good. I know I'm not good. Pastor's looking at me nervous. He said 45 minutes or this will detonate. He says they operated by cell phone these days. Ezekiel 28, there's the Antichrist who's called the Prince of Tyre. 
Most scholars agree that he's the Antichrist. Why? Because it says you are a man and not a God. And then it says you were the cherub in the Eden, in the garden of God. He was the angel in the God, most beautiful of all angels. That's Lucifer. And there he says he's a man. Whenever you read verses in the Bible about Lucifer and man at the same time, Antichrist. He dwells the Antichrist and he is trying to rule the world. And who destroys him? Look at that. Look at verse 7. Behold, therefore, God says, I will bring strangers against you. <coughs> now you know what your purpose is. Now you know what the purpose is. You're the strongest nation in the world. Now you know why God created this nation. If you don't know why God created this nation, then I ask you, who bombed the hell out of Germany? Who bombed the hell out of... Her Let me tell you about the story of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. You, most of you even never heard of Nagasaki. Let me tell you, Hiroshima, that's what it was. Nagasaki, that's it. Two nukes. Anybody else with a lip? That to me is America. America finally in the end pulls the club. Americans are the kind of people that, you know, good morning, how you doing, sir? They're so nice. You mess with them long enough. It's a different animal, let me tell you. I know you guys. I know you. You smile at me all the time. I know what behind those eyes. You are very violent. What's this whole thing about baseball bat? You want to solve the problem with terrorism and airplanes? Give every American baseball bat. Baseball bat, baseball bat, baseball bat. <laughs> Box cutter, baseball bats. That solves the problem, doesn't it? I will run TSA like a charm. I mean, I would fix it for you in one minute. Give every American a baseball bat. He brings strangers. Who are the strangers? The most terrible of the nations. Terrible doesn't mean ugly. Terrible in battle. The most powerful in battle. Who bombed the, the, the Iraqis? Going, raped Kuwait. Raped Kuwait. Who bombed the Iraqis? The Americans. God bless Americans when they bombed these raping murderers. Raped girls as young as eight, nine in front of their parents. And there was the Americans. Clean them all. But America is making mistakes these days. I am disappointed with America today. They support the Syrian revolution, which is Islamic fundamentalist. They support the Muslim Brotherhood. They support, they flipped Egypt upside down. You've been taken over by evil people. But not for long. God has a plan for this country. Look what it says in verse 8. They, those nations, shall throw you down into the pit. It is those nations that will defeat the Antichrist. The Antichrist doesn't rule the whole globe. If he does, why do you think the Bible gives us all these scenarios? Ten horns, ten toes, the body of a leopard, Greco, the, the feet of a bear, Persian, the mouth of a lion, Babylonian, Iraq, Arabia. That's the composite of the Antichrist. Why do you think it says four beasts come out of the Great Sea? Where is the Great Sea? The Mediterranean Sea. The Antichrist doesn't come from America. Obama's not the Antichrist. The Statue of Liberty is not the harlot of Babylon. The harlot of Babylon is what the Bible says it is. John was taken to the desert. There God took me to the desert. In the wilderness, empty place. There he showed me a woman riding on a scarlet beast. The city, he says, the woman is a city in a desert. Even Galatians 4, the war between the children of Sarah and her progeny. Us! And Hagar, Sinai in Arabia, Isaiah 21, the burden against the desert of the sea. The desert of the sea, a desert in the middle of oceanic water. Al Jazeera, Al Arabiya, the Arab island. They're even buying your TV stations. Al Gore sold out. They're buying you out. And continue the text, Isaiah 21. The burden against Arabia. Does that need any interpretation? Who destroys it in the end? Arise, oh, what? Persia, Iran. Did, did you know I won every single gentleman's bet with the prophecy scholars in America? Every single one.
They say, hey, Israel is going to attack Iran. No, he's not. Not yet. I was right every single time. Iran will get his nuke. Iran will nuke Saudi Arabia with the nuke. You don't believe me? Look what Saddam Hussein did. He started sending scouts at Saudi Arabia. Had he had a nuke, he would have nuked Saudi Arabia. The beast will destroy the harlot. The Muslim world itself will destroy Saudi Arabia. There's so many things that we need to talk about. Hours, days, and months of research. But I compiled everything in one book. I know I'm being a salesman now. My book is called God's War on Terror. In the Middle East, we produce a book. It's not like here. Where's the beef? We put all the beef for you. Everything's there from Genesis to Revelation. Looking what does the text says. The Bible says don't go beyond what is written in this book. The Bible I ended up discovering is a blessing, the greatest blessing. But it's also the greatest curse. The Bible is a curse. If you read into it what it does not say, and it's a blessing if you allow God to read what He wants to say for a change. Wake up, my fellow Americans. Wake up. Jesus Himself said, For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was naked and you clothed me. I was in prison and you visited me. He wants you to help the persecuted. Our brethren are being persecuted throughout the Middle East. When was the last time you put a dime to help these people who are dying? If you think that's not a small issue, if you think this is a small issue, face Jesus in the end. The ones who truly believe have done something about the persecuted. Look at what's happening in Egypt to our believers there. Syria, they're about to be slaughtered. We started a ministry to help those slaughtered in Egypt and Syria and in Pakistan and all these places. Look into these programs. Help out. Do something. It is one thing to say you love Christ. But as Christ said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. Christ said, to love your brother is to lay your life for your brother. As I am trying to lay my life for you. God bless you and thank you very much.